right now I'm preparing for an exhibition in China where we are presenting a work titled Voice of Sisyphus, which was created in 2011. In uh, 2017, we re redid it uh, to increase the resolution. And for the ZCAM, it was in an exhibition at the ZCAM called Datum Soria. And we were, we came across some unexpected challenges, which was that the Apple operating system had uh, introduced certain new uh, uh, limits that the early software wasn't prepared to handle. So, you know, there's an example of of where, where um, a work of art produced at a certain time for a certain uh, digital environment um, has to kind of be reformatted in certain ways for later. Now, today, there's certain ways to get around that because we're doing a third version right now in my lab. And this is going to be, whereas the previous one was in open frameworks and processing, the new one is going to be a Python-based standalone um, software. So yeah, so that's an interesting question. How how do you preserve a work later? Do you is it a uh, do you get the work to function in the way it was previously functioning, or do you describe the work? Uh, do you, do you document the work in a way that it talks about how it used to exist? And I don't really have an answer. A lot of that has to do with. Um, preservation strategies that have yet to be uh, conventionalized, you know, across across the institutions. So there's no real direct answer. Like my early 1992 works, um, I don't think I don't think we can present them today because, uh, for instance, the resolution is so small. The screen size was 640 by by um, 480. And and you know, in today's system we could we could try to expand the scale, but then you know it would be very pixelated. And it was done in software that do not exist tomorrow. Uh, I mean today. Any any of the works that were created at the early stage of digital media, there were always a conversation with what was possible in other words mm -hmm. what did the system allow what in terms of of what kind of speed complexity you know things like that and at the time one was just happy enough to to manage to complete the work um when it was time to present the work again at that time we we realized that one had to make uh much much more precise documentation than just have a screenshot and and a verbal description. So there, you know, there's something called the technical writer, which goes into detail of how to assemble a particular work once it goes goes onwards in time. I have a project in Seattle at the public library that collects data from from uh, the library itself by the hour. Mm -hmm. And when we, we did this project in 2005 with a with um, um, an engineer artist named Rama Hutzlein, who was my student at the time. Today, he's a professor. And, and basically, Rama did an amazing job of documenting. So th there's an 87 page description of how how the software works in case we need to reconstruct it on new new technologies right so so most of my work has been uh, on the screen and it's been interactive 
And um, so I, I've never really needed any special kind of equipment. Um, having said that, that's not really true. We did have an artwork named Tracing, where in 1997, where we we used some sensors by by which we we surrounded the space with sensors so that we knew exactly where the public was was standing and their placement determined you know what would happen on the screen so that, so yeah so if we were to sh present that work again the the we don't have those sensors anymore i come from photography and in 1986 was the first time that I could um, uh, create images that had somewhat photographic resolution. And I should say that actually I learned computing five years before in the studio of, of a painter named Harold Cohen, who was running a software to that would paint like him. And so that model of having the computer be a collaborator in the in the image making process was always present for me right from the beginning. But uh, in 1986, uh, I came across an equation for creating an image using frequency modulation. And uh, for a long time, I didn't know what to do with this. Uh, I wasn't able to to imagine how to integrate that into the art conversation. But over time, I would do projects with that. Eventually I did a, a installation, like a 2D flat large scale image for a subway station in Los Angeles. And then more recently during COVID, I started to go back to those those early algorithms and uh, coding to you know as a way to create it, works that didn't require a large team, and then we we meaning my my lab at the university, we were looking at all of the uh, machine learning uh, image generation uh, softwares like like generative adversarial networks and other kinds of softwares like that by which images could be created from other images. And then nine months ago, uh, out came uh, diffusion models, uh, generative artificial intelligence uh, image synthesis software, which all of a sudden made it super easy to make an image. So in that case, uh, all you do is you introduce either a text prompt and an image prompt. And it's very controversial. Yesterday, we had a speaker at the university who said it, it um, challenges uh, the artist, meaning it's replacing the artist. But in my case, I consider it to be uh, an actual asset. I consider it to be a collaborator of sorts. Um, whatever I'm producing with these works, the new works, uh, what remains is the image. The software doesn't matter. And the previous works that I was doing, where we wrote the software, or I wrote the software, then the artwork was actually the software itself. And the image was a evidence of how the software worked. So that's a kind of different way to think about how mm -hmm. these kind of, you know, software operate.